Thank you, Lou. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Hear me all right? Good. Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Direct, O Lord, our actions by your holy inspirations, and carry them on by your gracious assistance, that every prayer and work of ours may begin always with you, and through you be happily ended. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Mother of the Church. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you uh, this morning. The, uh, the topic that uh, Lou asked me to talk about is the urgency of ministry through sports, uh, seizing the opportunity. And so what I want to do here this morning is uh, give a little bit of an overview of the landscape of the different kinds of uh, sports ministries that are available uh, around our country, and uh, talk also from my own uh, perspective of the ways that we have uh, implemented some of those ministries in our diocese, uh, Springfield and Illinois. Uh, first, a commercial announcement. Uh, just a little plug here for my book, Holy Goals for Body and Soul, uh, Eight Steps to Connect Sports with God and Faith, uh, published by Ave Maria Press. And I brought some uh, copies along with me. Uh, so afterwards, if uh, they're in the back there, uh, Father Alfred's holding up a copy of the book. Um, and uh, I'll be available at the, I'll stay around for the morning, so uh, while the other talks are going on, if anybody wants me to sign a copy of the book, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, the list price is $13.95, but for you, such a deal, uh, they'll be available for $10 a piece. Uh, they are also available a uh, bulk order from uh, Ave Maria Press, uh, and um, if, you know, if you want to order them for your teams or the athletes that you uh, work with, uh, basically, just a very quick overview of my focus of my talk this morning is not the contents of the book, but just to give you an overview of uh, uh, some of the contents of this book and how I've used it for uh, sports ministry. Basically, I talked about these eight steps to connect sports with God and faith. Uh, the first three are, you might say, more negative sorts of challenges, fear, failure, and uh, frustration. And then the responses to those are, are positive responses, fortitude, faith, family, friendship, and fun. I say a lot of F-words in my book, <laughs> but I try to pe teach people the good ones. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, and just to give you a little taste of what, I, what I've tried to do with this book, so I, I talk about this, um, uh, about these eight steps through my experience of sports as a hockey player uh, and as a marathon runner. So in fact, um, that's me on the cover of the book, uh, and my goalie equipment, uh, practicing with the, uh, the Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, I was invited to uh, come and stay with them. You know, they, they've won the, the Stanley Cup uh, three times in the last six years. They're the reigning Stanley Cup champions right now. Love to be able to say that. Uh, that was not always the case. Uh, the, prior to 2010, their previous Stanley Cup was in 1961. Uh, so a long time, but 49 years intervened in between. Uh, but about 10 years ago, uh, the Blackhawks were not doing that well at the time, and I, when I was Auxiliary Bishop of Chicago, I came in my office one day and my secretary said I had a message from the Blackhawks, and I said, well, what do they want? They said, they want you to come out and practice with them. I said, well, they're really getting hard up for a goalie if they're calling me to come out, but uh, they had a new director of uh, public relations, and uh, it was actually kind of a, a public relations event. They had me come out and uh, skate with the team, so um, I suited up and got in the nets, and that's... Uh, picture of them taking some shots at me uh, and the Nets and then they did a little feature on the WGN uh, news uh, the next morning about the bishop coming out to, to bless the Blackhawks. Oh. It must have worked because then they won the Stanley Cup <laughs> three times. So. Um, but in, in terms of the, uh, the fears and frustrations and failures that, that we face in life, I talk about them from the perspective of sports. For example, I talk about the fears uh, that goalies have. and I, I will admit goalies uh, do have a very big fear when we get into the nets. It's not what most people would think. People might think that getting in front of uh, a net and having somebody shoot a uh, hard rubber vulcanized puck at you at 100 miles an hour, that that might uh, engender some fear in your heart. That's really not what we're afraid of. I've had injuries, broken fingers and scars and uh, knee surgery and, you, and lots of bruises and you just get back out there and, and play again. But, what, do, what are goalies afraid of? Giving up goals. 
giving up bad goals. It's the only sport, it's the only, it's the only job, it's the only profession, anything you do in life where if you make a mistake, a red light goes off behind you, you know, and a foghorn, and everybody calls attention. Imagine you're working at your desk and you make a mistake, and a red light goes off. Hey, look, you made a mistake. Well, that's what we goalies have to live with. So we live in this kind of constant paranoia uh, about giving up goals and, and always trying to do our best to avoid that. Uh, so when you face fears like that, but again, I use that, the whole point of the book is to talk about the, the fears, fail, failures, and frustrations that we face in sports, but then how we apply some of those things to everyday life. So uh, the fear of being a goaltender, for example, uh, most people, uh, there's two, two responses to fears. You can either face your fear or you can run from it. And most people, uh, in the hockey world, for example, I know people have been playing hockey for their whole lives as forwards and defensemen. They don't want anything to do with being a goalie. They say, you goalies are nuts. And admittedly, maybe we are. <laughs> but uh, so what do they do? What's the response is they'll avoid it. I don't want to play goalie. I love hockey and I'll, I'll play any other position, but don't put me in the nets. I don't want anything to do with it. So that's a valid response. You just avoid that. But for those of us who do play that position, and in fact love playing the position, I've been playing goalie since I was in eighth grade, um, you, you, you have to overcome your fear. And so applying that to something for, uh, that we have in everyday life, what's the biggest fear that we face in life? Well, polls show us that the, the number one fear is not death. Death comes actually in numbers, number two, the second place. Number one fear that most people face is doing what I'm doing right now, public speaking. People would literally rather die than get up in front of a group and give a talk. So again, how do, we, how do we deal with that? So for many people, it's to avoid it. You find yourself a job or profession or career where you're, you don't have to do this. Uh, but for those of us who do have to give public uh, speeches and get up in front of people, you learn how to deal with it. Now for me, this was a, this was a learned skill. Uh, I'm basically naturally kind of quiet and shy, so I, I had to learn this in the seminary about how to get up in front of people and give, give talks and uh, uh, give homilies. And so I took speech courses in college and I, I took homiletics when I was in the seminary. And it's a learned skill. <coughs> when I was in college, for example, I, I had my first speech course. And the, the first few assignments, you get up there, you, you, we were assigned a topic, you get up in front of people and have to talk. And you know, I kind of struggled with that. And then finally, the last assignment, uh, the teacher said, you can get up and talk about anything you want to talk about. Well, what did I talk about? Goaltending. <laughs> I put on my hockey equipment and I came in and I gave a show and tell of hockey equipment and how to play goalie. And after about 20 minutes, the professor said, I think, Mr. Viprake, we've heard enough of that. <laughs> but I was speaking from my heart. And so my point there is, uh, you know, you, you learn a skill like that. And, and uh, even if it's uh, not something that comes naturally, uh, you, you learn to, uh, to overcome your, your fears, your failures, and frustrations. And then the positive things that I mentioned, uh, fortitude, faith, family, friendship, and fun, those are all uh, the very wonderful aspects uh, that, that we uh, glean from the world of sports. Uh, I, from a family of nine children, uh, the oldest is a girl and the youngest is a girl and there's seven boys in between. So uh, six brothers, we kind of have our own built-in hockey team or baseball team. I, we want to play something, we just pick up sides and play it. You know, so it was really great uh, learning sports and, and getting involved in sports with my family and my father is the one who introduced us to, to hockey. He just, he never played it. He just had a great love for hockey. He used to take us to the Chicago Stadium to, to watch the game. So we had, we, you know, my family was a big um, part of that for me. And friendships, I've got friendships of people that I've made friendships with uh, playing hockey or, or training for marathons with uh, over the years that are still my friends to this day. And, um, and uh, faith, the important part of faith in what we do, I think, you talk to most athletes, and this is what we're going to be, what we're spending this conference really about the connection between sports and faith. You talk to most athletes, and, and if they're not praying as a team, they're probably praying privately. You know, when they they get in the batter's box or, or get in the hockey net, or when, I, I know when somebody's coming in on me on a breakaway, I say, Help me, Jesus. <laughs> and if I make the save, a quick thank you, Lord. You know, just uh, short little prayers like that are a very important part of our. our our sports life, and then fun. Uh, in the end, this is all supposed to be about, about fun. Really, sports are a game, 
And sometimes we have to keep reminding ourselves of that. Uh, I'll just give you a little, uh, little story about that. As a goalie coach at Sacred Heart Griffin High School, uh, we, uh, hockey is, is not as big in central Illinois as it is in some other parts of the state. So we only have one goalie on the team. And when I came there in Springfield in 2010, and then that goalie graduated, and the next year we, we for, were fortunate to have a freshman come in. Uh, again, the only goalie, so you've got a freshman who's the goalie. A goalie in, in itself is a very pretty high-pressure position. And so he was the only, he's the only goalie, he's the starting goalie. And, uh, you know, I felt a lot of pressure. So we, we won our first game 10-6. to six. We won, but he gave up six goals. He wasn't real happy about that. The next game we lost. And he was really beating himself up over that one. So the, and we happened to have a game the very next night in Champaign. Uh, and, uh, and so before the, uh, the game started, their usual routine is they do some warm-up shots and then the team comes over to the bench. The goalie would come over to me and I'd give him some last-minute uh, advice uh, or some pointers. And he, so he, he just gets over to me and, and uh, I said, to him, Keith, why are you playing this game? What's the objective? What, what do you... What do you hope to accomplish here? And he, I, he said, well, to win. I said, no, if this is not, a, your main objective is not to win. Your main objective is to come out here and have fun. And I, now, don't get me wrong, I'm very competitive. I love to win and I hate to lose. But I don't want you to beat yourself up so much every time you give up a goal or every time you lose a game that you're going to say, I hate this game. And when you graduate, you're going to say, I don't ever want to play that game again. I want you to love this game so much that you'll keep playing it for as long as I'm playing it. And I'm still playing hockey uh, at my age and uh, so because I love it uh, so much. And uh, so in, in the world of, of, uh, of faith, um, we have to remember that faith is about joy. It's about happiness. You know, Pope Francis talks about the, the joy of the gospel. And... Um, there too, we sometimes we can get so serious. I mean, faith is a serious matter, of course, but sometimes we can get so serious about it that we forget that. What did Jesus say in the Beatitudes? Uh, every one of the Beatitudes starts with the word beatus, which can be translated as blessed, or some translations as happy. Happy are the peacemakers. Happy are the pure of heart. All we follow all these things, and eventually, what we're striving for is happiness with God and His kingdom. So to always keep that at the forefront of what we're what we're talking about. So. Um, that's just a picture of me running my last marathon. I did finish the uh, Springfield Marathon uh, last uh, October, my 21st marathon in 21 years. And uh, I used to run um, Chicago. I did this seven times. Uh, with, there were a lot more people. And I, I stopped running Chicago, uh, Chicago's marathon, not just because I'm in Springfield now, uh, but also because uh, it just got too big there. So as you can see, there's, there's not that big a crowd there. Uh, and Springfield is much more intimate uh, marathon, but uh, it's just uh, it's a great joy to be able to do that. And uh, I've been raising money as part of my marathon running now for several years, and in 21 marathons, I've raised a little over $400,000. So right now, I'm averaging about $20,000 a marathon. So uh, that kind of keeps me running too, <laughs> uh, knowing that uh, people are pledging and they're they're supporting me behind them. Okay, so that's just a little bit of an overview of my background and my involvement uh, with, with sports. Uh, let's talk now about our ministry of, of, uh, and, and the urgency of ministry through sports. So, um, this is the approach some people uh, take, no sporting events on Sunday. And uh, in fact, when I was uh, auxiliary bishop in Chicago, we had a proposal before the Presbyterian Council that this was seriously discussed, of having a policy of not allowing any sports, at least through our Catholic uh, schools, our Catholic school systems, of not allowing any sports on Sunday. And let me say, first of all, that in some senses I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I would love, I would love for all of our people, our families, uh, to be so committed to their Catholic faith that they would say, you know, the proposal to have a game on Sunday morning, that they would say, oh no, we, we can't do that because we'll be in church on Sunday morning. It would be wonderful if, if that were the case. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And so we, we live in a world, we, and some describe it even as a post-Christian world, where there are so many things competing for our attention and for our time and our, our energy and our loyalties that uh, it's to say that uh, we're, 
not going to allow sporting events on Sunday and hope that that will somehow bring people into the church, I, I just don't think is very effective. And so what is the approach that we can take to that? I think a better approach is to coordinate and integrate our sporting events with Sunday Mass and the religious education uh, schedule. What do I mean by that? So, um, for example, when this was being discussed at our Federal Council, I, I pointed out that, in, in my experience, uh, what, before I became bishop, I was uh, chancellor of the Archdiocese, and I used to help out in a parish on the south side of Chicago. And at this parish uh, on the southwest side, during the football season, they played on Sunday mornings, late on Sunday morning. But the whole team would come to Mass before the game. They would come, be there at the 9 o'clock Mass. And in fact, I mean, they would be there in their uniforms. The whole team seated right in front with their uniforms and all the coaches. And that was the only time I ever saw them in church. <laughs> uh, we, got, we got the coaches to church. That's wonderful. We got all the players, and they're, they're there. And the reason that they came to church was because they had a game that day. So ironically, if we had a policy of no games on Sunday, they wouldn't have been there in church. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, while we might want, as I'm saying, for people to, to say that, okay, we're not going to have games on Sunday, but we're going to go to church, maybe having games on Sunday is not always that bad a thing. Uh, because there's the example I'm giving you, in some cases, it, it, maybe it's the door, it's to bring people in. In other cases, uh, you may um, find that uh, you just have to be flexible with who you're working with. Now, I'm going to try see if uh, Lou, am I hooked up to the internet here? Do you know? I'm praying. I want to follow. What's that? <laughs> you praying? All right. Now, how do I how do I get this to? Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, there we are. Can you see that? This is a story at our Sunday Visitor Weekly. Um, I thought it was a pretty good story. In soccer mom era, sports and faith go head to head. Uh, busy youth sports schedules force parishes to be flexible and creative when working with families. And um, they talk about the conflict here. Uh, when it comes to scheduling, many families feel caught between their church and team, and religious obligations often lose out. Surveys show competing Sunday activities were responsible for declining worship attendance with many respondents pointing to sports, so blaming the sports. Uh, what are some responses? Flexible scheduling. Across the country, Catholic parishes are seeking new approaches to dealing with the challenge, which religious education directors estimate is growing. Some, like St. John the Evangelist, offer on -like online coursework. Others have switched from year-long schedules to multi-week series to accommodate students during sports off-season. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul in Brooklyn, Minnesota, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, offers the same course multiple times each week. At St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Hiawatha, Iowa, students can attend a week-long summer program. The best parish models are those that are creative and flexible, providing programs at multiple times and multiple ways. They've taken seriously the church's direction in that we're supposed to work with families in raising their children, and sports have a lot of value. Now, I know that's more work for people. It's, it's much easier to say we do, we do religious education on Sunday morning right after Mass or whatever, however you do it, and that's the time. And if you can't make it at that time, I'm sorry, you just are not going to get religious education. Well, I mean, that's one approach uh, to take, but what they're suggesting here is we live in a world that is a little more complex, and maybe we have to be, instead of demanding that people somehow fit our schedules, maybe we have to be a little more flexible and offer other opportunities. So they're as suggested here, can you repeat the same program at different times during the week so people have an option, so Sunday morning isn't the only option. Maybe there's another time during the week when you can, can do this, or uh, suggest even online uh, possibilities here. So what I'm saying here is that, uh, you know, not necessarily the um, the answer to everything here, but um, but we, we have to consider options. Okay, Lou, how do I get out of this now? Let me see. Other questions? Yeah. 
Other side of the window, Richard. Other side of the window. Where do I go here? Left. Uh, left. left. I'm not familiar with the. I don't use a Mac. Red dot. This dot.
here as well. And so uh, it would be nice, so I said bad news only in the sense it would be nice if we had like one Catholic uh, sports organization. If we all got a part of that, uh, it would be very strong and very powerful. Well, we're, we, we're not there yet, and, and, and our competition is very fierce in that regard. Uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes has been around, I think, since the 1950s or so. And, uh, and they, are, they, they might seem at, at very monolithic. Uh, and, you know, they do, they do some good things, too, as long as they're not anti-Catholic, which they can be in some instances. And uh, so just a, a little footnote on that. I mean, you, you may have, uh, even on some of our Catholic schools, uh, involvement of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And, um, and that's, that's not bad, as long as I said, as long as they're not anti-Catholic in that. So if it's getting together and reading the Bible and having Bible study and a liturgy of the word, that's fine. But I also describe liturgy of the word, that's kind of half the loaf. You know, in the Catholic Church we have word and sacrament. So the Catholic part of this we say, well, the sacrament is, yeah, what do we, in terms of the, what do we offer in terms of the church? We have the sacraments, we have opportunities for athletes to go to confession, uh, to go to mass, receive the Eucharist. Uh, these are things we should also be doing. Uh, but they can actually get... Uh, anti-Catholic, uh, and that's something we have to look out for. Uh, I know at the major league level, um, I hear lots of stories about um, athletes coming from Latin America, uh, where they are raised in the Catholic faith, and they come up to play major league baseball, and, uh, and get into a, a team that has a strong uh, um, locker, locker room chapel, and, uh, and they'll come out of there saying, and using these words, I used to be Catholic, but now I'm Christian. So, well, hello, we Catholics are Christians too. But there are some elements of uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes that will take that, so we, we need to be uh, aware of that as well. But what I want to give you uh, here is an overview of the landscape of our uh, Catholic sports ministries, and there are quite a few. Uh, and just to run through them, uh, a little bit about each. Catholic Youth Organization, Sports Leader, uh, Catholic Athletes for Christ, Varsity Catholic, Sports Faith International, the Play Like a Champion Today National Sports Leadership Conference at the University of Notre Dame, and uh, a group called Life Runners. And I've been involved with, uh, which, with each one of those to, to one extent or another. And uh, so I'd like to say a little bit about each. Uh, Catholic Youth Organization is probably the oldest that's been around uh, for a long time. It's part of uh, the National uh, Catholic Federation of Youth Ministry. And uh, uh, some links to some websites, we don't have time to go into all of these, uh, but if you, the first link there is the National uh, Catholic Youth Organization, and uh, uh, you'll see there that there, there are all kinds of activities going on uh, that involve uh, sports, and there are also diocesan CYO groups, so if you were just to Google uh, CYO, what comes up are some of these diocesan groups. So that first one is CYO of Los Angeles, and the second one is the uh, Catholic Youth Organization of the uh, Diocese of Cleveland. And uh, what I, it seems in, in my experience that the, the CYO uh, not only has been around longer, but seems to be more <coughs> active in some of the larger dioceses. So uh, coming from the Archdiocese of Chicago, I know we had, we had uh, CYO in the Archdiocese of Chicago. We don't have uh, CYO involved in the Diocese of Springfield, so I don't know if that's something that's common across the country that you would have more involvement in the, in the bigger uh, metropolitan areas where CYO has the opportunity to, to form leagues and you know different schools competing with each other. And our diocese is a little bit harder to do that. We cover the whole width of the state of Illinois, and so where there's great geographic distances uh, between us, so our, we tend to have to focus a little bit more on what's happening in each one of the schools. Also, to be quite frank about this, in some cases, because CYO is, in a sense, the oldest and has been around the longest in some ways, uh, it's, in some cases, it's just gotten a little rusty. You know, so it may be that CYO is there in name uh, and, and some organizational charts, but there may not be a whole lot going on. And I, I know that's always a constant uh, challenge in youth ministry, is how to keep it fresh and so, you know, just because some things work for a few years doesn't mean it's going to necessarily keep going. You have to refresh, you have to press the reset button every once in a while and get things going. Uh, but basically, you know, and with those cases, uh, with all of these, it kind of depends on how it's being implemented. In some cases, CYO 
may be working very well. In other cases, maybe it needs a little more attention. Uh, this is from their website, their mission, and I, I pulled off of each website their mission and their vision, and you're going to hear a lot of similarities uh, between this. And so it's not so much that we're, I think, competing with each other, uh, but we are, in some cases, doing the same thing, but maybe in different ways, and in some ways complementing each other. So the mission of the CYO, National CYO, says their mission is to animate the gospel values in Catholic youth sports, to encourage young people to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, their vision is the service of uh, NFCYM uh, that educates leaders about opportunities in sports for evangelization, catechesis, and growth in their knowledge of intimacy uh, with, uh, with Jesus Christ. And the national organization, uh, the National Federation for Catholic Youth Ministry, they're basically the ones that put on that, uh, that big NCYC every couple of years or so in Indianapolis. So uh, a lot of people are involved with that. Sports Leader, of course, is hosting uh, this conference, and uh, uh, you'll hear more about it from, from Lou Judd. Uh, we have Sports Leader involved in our diocese of uh, Springfield in Illinois, uh, and I would describe it this way. Basically, Sports Leader focuses more on the, on the coaches and on the leaders. Um, one of their hallmarks is the virtue of the week. And I think uh, with a lot of these organizations, there's pros and cons. One of the, the pros, I think, of sports leader is by working through the coaches uh, and having this virtue of the week, you have very frequent contact uh, that the coaches can bring this into every practice. And they can spend, you know, at the beginning of practice to talking just for a couple of minutes about the virtue of the week. And the advantage of that is you get, the whole, you get all the athletes. You can touch all of your athletes in your sport program through something like Sports Leader and their Virtue of the Week. Uh, the disadvantage, you might say, is, is that it's a smaller dose. So you gotta, you gotta give a concentrated shot of that uh, and maybe don't have a lot of time to get into more depth with it because now you have to, you have to practice. As they're there for practice. So, touch a lot of people, but not necessarily as, as deeply as you, you might like to. The other, one of the other things that is very uh, beneficial about the Sports Leader program is that um, by talking about virtues, the curriculum, as I understand, is, is in fact designed in such a way that it can be used in public schools without worrying about violating the separation of church and state. So Sports Leader has a, a Catholic background, a Catholic uh, uh, mindset, you might say, but, um, but is not as overtly talking about uh, uh, faith in Jesus Christ as it is promoting these virtues that come out of our, our faith. One of the things that, that we do um, in our diocese uh, that sports uh, leader promotes is a rosary rally. So we've uh, done this the last couple of years now in October, uh, inviting, we, we have um, uh, seven Catholic high schools in Springfield, so we invite all the Catholic high schools to uh, come, uh, usually try to pick a central location, either Springfield or Decatur, uh, and then we'll do this outdoors in October. The weather's usually still good enough, we'll do this outside. And uh, we'll have a, uh, in a in football stadium, have all the athletes there. Uh, our first one we did in Decatur, in the St. Teresa High School in Decatur. Uh, Lou was there uh, for that and gave a talk. And, uh, and, and the whole football team was there wearing their uniforms. So I mean, I wait for them to give kind of public witness to the fact that they're football players or whatever sport you're playing, and they're there uh, to pray the rosary. Lou will remember that uh, it was October uh, of, uh, uh, last year, and I had just run a marathon that day, and, and uh, it was the only Sunday I had available, so I came right from running the marathon to uh, pray the rosary with sports leaders. So I was uh, kind of hobbling my way uh, up the up the uh, altar that day, but it was great to be able to come from a marathon right to a rosary rally with sports leader. So uh, this is right from the sports leader website. Sports leader is a Catholic virtue-based formation program for coaches for, of all ages. The four pillars are virtue, mentoring, ceremony, and Catholic identity. It's for boys, girls, young men, and young women. It is for schools and teams who are interested in a structured, intentional, and specific method and curriculum to help teach virtue. It is flexible, easy to implement, and is designed for the coach to integrate into their practice schedule. All right, another organization uh, that I'm involved with is called Catholic Athletes for Christ. Uh, in fact, I'm the uh, chairman of the Episcopal Episcopal Advisory Board of Catholic Athletes for Christ. So we have a, we have a board of uh, bishops uh, that help to advise uh, Catholic Athletes for Christ. And 
So Catholic Athletes for Christ started in 2006. A lot of these or organizations, you'll see there's uh, many of them started about 10 years ago or so. The ones that are, the newer ones that have kind of sprung up. And so this started in 2006 with this initial focus on major league sports, primarily baseball and, um, and football. And in working with Ray McKenna, the president of Catholic Athletes for Christ and our Episcopal Advisory Board, uh, one of the things that, that the bishops advised, we said, well, if you want to have athletes at the professional level to talk publicly about their faith, you have to plant those seeds sooner. It's not going to just sort of suddenly sprout, spring up when they hit a major league locker room. So if we want a Catholic version of, of Tim Tebow, somebody who's willing to talk about his faith, specifically his Catholic faith, uh, we're going to need to pl start planting those seeds earlier. So that's why we came up with this idea of starting high school chapters. Uh, so let's get our high school athletes uh, involved and familiar with this organization about Catholic Athletes for Christ so that if someday some of them make it to the major league level, uh, then when they talk, they'll talk about Catholic Athletes for Christ and their involvement with Jesus Christ, uh, not as uh, something that they're, they're learning on the spot, but something that's deeply uh, rooted and embedded in their, in their faith lives. We provide a curriculum, or Catholic Athletes for Christ provides a curriculum for our weekly uh, meeting. So uh, that for our first year, for example, what we did was use the curriculum basically from my book for the first semester. So we had the eight steps of connecting uh, sports with God and faith, and we, we use that as a, a subject matter for a meeting. Now, again, pros and cons. Uh, one of the, the downsides of our approach with Catholic Athletes for Christ is that we have fewer participants. So it, it focuses on a weekly meeting, and the weekly meetings are, it's kind of up to the local school when we have those weekly meetings. Uh, they could be in the morning before school starts or, or during a free period during the school day or after school or in some cases on Sunday. Uh, the disadvantage of doing that, of course, is now you're asking these students, these young athletes, to come on their free time. And so that means extra time from their schedule. As a result, you don't get as many. As I say, sports leader, you can, you can talk to all of your athletes briefly at, at the beginning of practice. Uh, this is asking them to come, so it's not during practice time. You're not taking a practice with, uh, with, with talking about this, but you're asking them to come to a meeting for an hour or, or, or an hour and a half, whatever you do. So um, at Sacred Heart Griffin High School in Springfield, for example, we, uh, for the first year we were doing it on Sunday nights because it was all we had, uh, we have a chapter of Fellowship of Christian Athletes that uh, S, S, uh, SHG. And so we would we kind of followed their model. They would come off for the first few minutes and they play basketball. We'd go in the gym, they play basketball, they shoot around, just kind of get them, you know, doing stuff that kids like to do. And then going through their door, <laughs> bringing them our door, all right, come in, we're going to read some scripture, we're going to do a reflection on it. A kind of a similar model to what uh, FCA was doing. But then trying to Catholicize this, you know, so also having opportunities for praying the rosary together uh, for. Uh, the sacraments, the uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, hearing confessions, uh, team masses, things like that. But again, the disadvantage is you, we don't get real big numbers for that, admittedly. So uh, some of our, our schools are struggling. If they get a dozen kids off for a meeting, that's pretty good. So 12, 20, 30 would be a really good showing, you know, if you get a meeting like that. But it gives an opportunity to go deeper. The ones that are coming can spend a little more time reflecting on this. So um, we uh, have, uh, in addition to those weekly meetings, we have what we call a, a senior springboard event. So we just uh, we just had ours in Springfield. Father Chase Hilgenbrink was who's here with us. He was our guest speaker. Uh, talked about uh, his experience of going from being a professional soccer player uh, to uh, leaving a professional uh, athletic career to uh, entering the seminary and becoming a priest as he is now for the Diocese of Peoria. Uh, so we do that in the spring. So our, our two events where we try to get our, our athletes together from around the diocese in the fall, we have our, our sports leader program, our rosary rally, and in the spring we have our, um, our senior springboard event with Catholic Athletes for Christ. And so we, we are using both programs in our diocese, sports leader and Catholic Athletes for Christ, and I think they work very well together. And I've asked the coaches that. I said, is this... Uh, how do you like working with two different organizations? And the feedback I get is they, they like that because they see how they complement each other. Sports leader working with the, the 
coaches primarily and bringing that into touching all the athletes, but then an opportunity through CAC to delve a little deeper with that. Uh, we, uh, the high school programs are, are not uh, very widespread at this point. They started a few years ago. The first diocese was Trenton, New Jersey. Our diocese in Springfield is only the second to do that. And now there's a third diocese, Green Bay, is also doing it. Uh, how did we do it in Springfield? Basically, um, I, I took a whole year of laying the foundation, so we were talking about it. Uh, I asked the <coughs> superintendent of our schools, uh, of our diocesan school system, to spearhead this in conjunction with the uh, director of our um, diocesan office for youth ministry. Uh, so we formed a steering committee. We meet monthly. Uh, or every other, every other month, I meet with them to show, I emphasize the importance of this, that I'm there for the steering committee meeting. So I'm very involved with sports ministry in, in my diocese. And I think the involvement of, a, of the bishop gives a message that I really consider this to be very important. And, and they get that message. Um, and so we spent that whole year of the, the school office and the youth ministry office working with principals uh, and then locally trying to, to drum up support because I didn't want to just announce, hey folks, from, we're going we're to start this sports ministry program. No, you've got to lay the foundation. You've got to make sure your coaches are on board with this. You've got to make sure you've got some clergy on board. We found, for example, in our, in our high school chapters, the key to having a successful high school chapter uh, of sports ministry, is you need two, I think, two key people involved. Uh, you need a coach, preferably someone who is on the full-time faculty. So a, a coach that the students see every day, and they know this coach by name, um, but they also know he's a, he or she's a coach. You get the head football coach in an area where football is the biggest sport, go for it. If you're from Minnesota and hockey is your biggest sport, get your hockey coach in, to be involved with this. Somebody that the kids are going to look up to, um, and they'll say, well, when the coach is involved with this, and, and, the, and the coach is willing to talk about his or her faith, that's going to have a big impact. The second person that I think is very important to have involved is a priest, especially if we're going to Catholicize this. So yes, you can, you can have very wonderful meetings without a priest. You can have Bible study and reflection and all that. But if we're going to Catholicize this, we need those opportunities where you're going to have a priest come in and offer the sacraments, to an opportunity to hear confession. Some, some teams actually do this during practice. They'll have the, the priest will be out on, on the football field. You know, and while the football team's practicing, he'll be on the sidelines, and it's, it's, it makes it known. Anybody who wants to go to confession can do that. I'm thinking about doing that in hockey. I'll go sit in the penalty box for a while. <laughs> anybody wants to come to confession, come over to the penalty box. I'll be <laughs> so that's one way of doing it. Um, so the free, uh, a coach, a full-time faculty member coach, and, and a priest to be involved uh, to uh, Catholicize it. So um, there's just a little bit of background there about CAC, their mission to serve athletes and share the gospel of Christ in and through athletics. Again, very similar language to what some of the organi other organizations are doing. Provide an in integrated network of sports, energy, clergy, and lay people to serve Catholic athletes, coaches, and staff in the practice of their faith, and to utilize the unique platform given to them to reach the world for Jesus Christ and his church. Uh, the vision to develop and promote solid Catholic role models to work with the church leadership, Catholic organizations, minister to the Catholic athletes, coaches, and staff, and then to reverse the moral crisis in sports today, to create a network of Catholic athletes, coaches, and staff, and to organize sports conferences, pilgrimages, retreats, and days of, re of reflection. All right, Varsity Catholic, uh, you're going to be hearing more about, or you heard the Tom talk yesterday? So Tom, you, so you heard a little bit about Varsity Catholic already. It's focused at the college and university levels. It's an initiative of the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. I view, uh, I view Varsity Catholic um, as basically a bridge, uh, for, for in our diocese at least, a, a bridge between the high school level and professional level. So at the high school level, you've got, if you've got Catholic Athletes for Christ or Sports Leader or whatever, or CYO, whatever program you're going at, at the high school level, at the college level, again, we don't want to duplicate things. So, um, so on the Episcopal Advisory Board of Catholic Athletes for Christ, we're not going to go into the college level because we already have Varsity Catholic there. So we we in conversation with Tom Wirtz, and so he, he came to meet with our Episcopal Advisory Board. We talked about how do we coordinate these things so students can go seamlessly from a high school sports ministry program into Varsity Catholic at the college level, and if they're 
robust enough, talented enough to go into professional sports, and how then, at the major league level, can we get them involved with an organization like Catholic Athletes for Christ? Again, core values, mission, uh, very similar to the kinds of things that we've heard previously, and then I won't go into all this because you've already heard from Tom about this as well. Sports Faith International is another organization I'm involved with. It's based in Chicago, founded by Patrick McCaskey, who's the chairman of their advisory board. He is the grandson of the Chicago Bears founder, George Hallis, who, by the way, founded the Chicago Bears, not in Chicago, but in my diocese now, in Springfield. Uh, they started out as the, the Decatur Staley's, in Decatur, Illinois, and after a couple of years, uh, uh, the Staley Factory Company decided this was not going to be a profitable uh, venture for them. <laughs> so they let George take it up to Chicago, <laughs> and uh, he had to keep the name for a couple of years. For so for a couple of years, they were the Chicago Staleys, and then uh, eventually they changed the name to the Chicago Bears. But uh, Patrick McCaskey, his mother is Virginia McCaskey, the daughter of George Hallis. Um, still very involved with the, with the team herself, very pro-life. Um, and so Patrick has uh, started this organization called Sports Faith International. It basically promotes sports and faith through the media. And they have an annual event they call the Sports Faith Hall of Fame induction ceremony. Um, and they we're going to be doing that the Saturday before Pentecost. So it used to be in January, but we moved that uh, to the spring. And uh, so it'll be coming up in May on the day before uh, Pentecost. Their mission, uh, create and promote sports and faith documentaries, radio shows, podcasts, television programs, interactive content, events and uh, contests and furtherance of its goals of positively transforming the culture, providing uh, uh, programs, so it's very media-centered, uh, get big names from sports that carry on the vision of St. John Paul II, known as the Athletes Pope. Uh, using the media aggressively to promote uh, faith and utilize sports as a powerful instrument to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another one to mention, uh, Play Like a Champion Today, the National Sports Leadership Conference at the University of Notre Dame. Um, some of you may have attended this. Uh, it's an annual conference. Uh, it's a university-based initiative focused on promoting a positive sports culture for all young people. They work with coaches, parents, administrators around the country to develop ethically responsible sports leaders and to promote character development through sports. They have on-site clinics and workshops, online courses, and an annual summer leadership conference at Notre Dame. There's going to be another conference coming up, uh, and I believe it's in June. Uh, I've attended that as well. So again, these are things that kind of complement uh, each other. I, I was a speaker there at uh, the conference uh, uh, a, a year and a half ago. Life Runners is another organization. Um, this is a organization, Catholic organization for uh, for runners. Uh, it's a pro-life running group. So uh, they uh, they pray, fundraise, and run, walk as a team until we cross the finish line that ends abortion. All in Christ for pro-life. Annually, the Life Runners gather for a national spring relay, a national fall marathon, along with. Uh, races of other distances and also sponsors some local races. So I mentioned this one. I'm also the uh, Episcopal advisor for the Life Runners uh, group, and um, it has 87 chapters with over 4,000 runners and walkers in all 50 states and in 25 countries. Our mission is to raise prayers, awareness, and funds to help end abortion. Values keep the faith, respect life from conception to natural death, and run so as to win. So uh, they do pick a marathon every year. I've run a few marathons with the Life Runners. Um, since I've been running for 21 years, so I've been running uh, marathons before Life Runners came to be. But the last uh, few years, I ran together uh, with uh, Life Runners uh, in Kansas City and in St. Louis. Uh, I skipped 2014 because I had foot surgery that year. Uh, I ran a marathon last year, but I didn't run with the Life Runners because it was the same weekend as the NCC, the USCCB meeting in Washington, but this year they're going to be running in, in Philadelphia in November, and so God willing I'm going to run my 22nd marathon with the uh, Life Runners uh, in November. So to sum up, there's lots to choose from out there. So uh, maybe you've heard of some of these organizations, didn't know exactly what each one of them was doing. Uh, now I think we have a better picture, but I, I think um, what I want to communicate is there's no need to choose only one of them say, well, gee, there's all these to choose from. Which one am I going to choose? And uh, 
Now, maybe, maybe for budget reasons or whatever, you have to concentrate your focus, or what's available in your diocese. So if your diocese has a big CYO program going, well, then I don't think there's a need to start anything new. But if you're in a, in a place where things are kind of dormant and there's, there's not much going on in terms, in terms of sports faith ministry, well, maybe you want to look at one of these newer organizations, or a couple of them, as I said, like we've done in Springfield, working both with Sports Leader and with Catholic Ethics for Christ. Um, and these different programs can complement each other in very wonderful ways. I also want to really emphasize, to those of you that are coaches, are involved somehow as a sports leader, that the that role of that coach, the sports leader, the director of sports ministry, is it's vital and important. And you may not even realize how much influence you have over your athletes. You have a lot of influence over your athletes. Sometimes, in some cases, more than their parents. Now that may be sad to say, but uh, and, and, uh, and ideally, yes, the parents are the first teachers of the faith. And we hope and pray that they have a good relationship with their parents, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the parents are separated or divorced. Maybe there's no father figure, so the coach, uh, a male coach, becomes the father figure for that athlete. Uh, or, uh, you know, just there, there's no strong role models in the family, and they look to, to the coach uh, to be that leader. And uh, I have found that myself, my experience, I, I didn't do any coaching until I, I came to Springfield and I was asked then to help with the hockey team as a goalie coach. And I just, and I, and I talked to the athletes, not just the goalies, but all the athletes uh, on, on the team. And I go to the football games, the, the Catholic High School Sacred Heart Griffin actually rents from our, our they're on our Catholic, our, the property of our diocese, so I, um, it's right in our backyard, so I'll go out to the football games. I'll be on the sidelines with the, with the players. And I, I just see, you know, when I, sometimes when I'll talk to a player, talk to a player one-on-one, -on -one and they're just looking at you with these big eyes, like soaking in every word, and, and you realize how, how important it is what you say to them and how you say it, and to communicate that you care for them and that you really want, you're not just there to win a game, but you're there because you, you love them and you care for them and you want them uh, to learn and, and to be successful, not only in the sports, but what they learn and their sports is going to carry them uh, throughout their lives. So, uh, if there's any one message that uh, you take away from this, I would come back to this point. Uh, enter through their door, but bring them out through our door. Their door is sports. And that's why we're all here. We're in sports ministry. And it's a wonderful world. Uh, I love sports. It's great to get into that world. But remember, that's, that's not where we stop. That's not where any youth ministry stops. We have this, uh, youth ministry, uh, whether it's sports or skiing or uh, going to Disney World or whatever you're doing, or just going out for pizza, uh, that's just a means to an end. And the end the goal is eternal life with God on high in his kingdom.